I'd like to take a moment to introduce our next speakers. Uh, so we talked a little bit about in the panel about sort of the future of game development and everything. Um, and this, I think, is a great example of that. Um, these are two folks that are covering sort of a new sector in game development. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mathieu and David uh, from Babel and Oculus. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> Good. Good. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt. I'm David from Oculus. <laughs> uh, before we start, uh, this uh, presentation runs in the form of a quiz. Uh, if you don't have the app, the XDS app downloaded, I would highly recommend you download it now uh, so you can actually participate in the quiz. Uh, if you skip a few f of the first questions, no worries. You can just jump in uh, once, uh, once you're in. So let's start. Good. Question one. We've had companies trying to market VR and AR before, and it flopped. How do we know that it's actually for real this time? Answer number one, look at all those games. Two. Big companies are on it now. Three, it's already used for so much stuff. And four, obviously, just before, because we're giving a talk about it. Put in your answer now. Four. Number two. Number two. Quam, quam. Starts bad, minus two. Uh, the reason is essentially because it's, it's already used for so much stuff. Big companies tried this before. Google tried this. Nintendo tried this. A lot of other companies tried this. Um, but there's, there's a lot more traction now, just because it's not just games, it's medical, it's educational, it's porn, it's a lot of stuff. Um, if we look at the numbers, uh, just in the last year up to the end of the second quarter of the year, uh, there was $2 billion in, in investment. A whole lot of that in, in AR, but still. And if we look at the projections for 2020, it's insane. It goes to 90 billion for augmented reality and 30 billion for VR. A uh, good portion of that into the game industry. Um, if we look at the projection in terms of install units uh, for VR, AR, MR uh, units that would go into the current PC console market, you know, we're looking at a growth that will go over 300 million uh, in the next five years. And if you look at the mobile one, you'll see that the scale is actually 20 times bigger. And it goes into the billions. Uh, and that's insane. And that's quite logical, because the barrier for entry is a lot lower. This investment is essentially the same information I showed you initially. Uh, it's just that you're seeing the progression since 2011. This is actually a very conservative, probably the most conservative evaluation that we found online from Goldman Sachs in terms of revenue, both for hardware and software. Uh, by 2025, almost 80 billion. By 2020, 28 billion. This is a more optimistic uh, evaluation. And um, Sorry for the language. Obviously, until it actually happens, all those numbers are bullshit. But still, it's, it's still a huge number. Even the lowest forecasts that, that are set right now are extremely high. And this, you know, it, it's a lot further away from the 28 billion. It's close to 150. We, me and David actually seen evaluation that went up to 162 billion uh, by 2020. Question two, you're building a VR team. How long does it take to ramp them up? Does it take three hours, three days, three weeks, or three months? So the answer with the most responses so far is number three, three weeks. Three weeks. Um, it actually takes about three months to get a team ramped up in VR. Uh, it's actually very easy to get pixels up on screen. Unity will help you do that. Unreal will help you do that. But there's so many new best practices and techniques that it usually takes your dev teams about three months to get integrated. You've got to hit 60 hertz on mobile. You've got to hit 90 hertz on PC. That's on two different screens. 
and just different stuff goes wrong. Left eye gets switched with right eye. Particles sometimes draw on the left side of the screen, but they draw on the right. You have strange judder. Um, so you can get bad VR in about three hours. But to get your teams up and running really well in VR, it takes about three months to get them used to aiming for that perf profile. Yeah, this, this is what we've seen as, yet, as of yet uh, as well. And, and actually, a few, uh, maybe a month or two ago, David asked me uh, how much time it actually built our team. And I told him, if I give you like a truly honest answer, uh, before they were good and productive, it's about three months. And uh, I was expecting an answer like, oh, it's interesting. And David was just, yes, it's correct. <laughs> uh, it's three months. That's a good answer. Congrats. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does take a long time to actually get uh, those guys up and running. Uh, and we, on our side, we were lucky enough that we were working directly with Oculus because they know it takes that amount of time. We have other clients in VR and AR. They would not have waited three months for us to be really up to speed and productive on this. Chris, how many points as of yet? Minus two. <laughs> uh, question number three. You're setting up a VR lab, you're getting employees involved, you're getting them into testing. How long can they last in that headset? Can they last for 30 minutes? Can they last for four hours? Can they last for a full working day at eight hours? Or does it depend? And the winner is? Um, number one, max 30 minutes. 30 minutes, wow, you guys are doubters. That's gonna be rough. Numbers aren't bullshit, VR is real. Anyway, um, it does depend. The answer is it does depend. Uh, like I said, it takes about three months to get your teams ramped up on VR. The reason why that happens is because you're able to do bad VR very quickly, and bad VR can make anyone sick. Um, if the 3D is off, you can start to get headaches, and if it's bad VR, you're just messing with your eyes. The trick is, when we get to motion sensitivity and how long can people last on the headset because of motion? And that answer is very different because just like in real life, different people are sensitive to different types of motion. If you get sick in the backseat of a car, you will get sick back in the backseat of a car in VR. If you get sick on a roller coaster, you will get sick in a roller coaster in VR. And so the same tricks that we know how to cope with motion sickness in real life, closing your eyes, going for a walk, getting fresh air, uh, drinking a ginger beer is a great one. Uh, if you come from a household like mine, you were given pieces of orange peel dried up. Those all help with nausea and make a cope. So now you need to apply those same techniques to VR, and all of a sudden, things are a little bit more comfortable. I would say on average, um, we actually have experiences that we've launched in our store where the average session time is over an hour. Uh, we've seen the longest session times go up to five to six hours. So it really depends on the experience. What adds to this is, is people get used to it. So as you have a team that's building expertise, they are no longer as sensitive to motion as they once were before. If you remember back when first-person shooters first started, people couldn't play Doom, they couldn't play Quake, they couldn't play these first-person shooters because they weren't used to that motion. We got used to it. We're seeing the same thing happen in VR today. The trick is, as you're building your team is, you actually want a wide variety of different sensitivities. Because so many people are new to the market, so many people are trying VR for the first time, you need to make sure you have your fail-safe candidate, which we usually refer to as the most sensitive person on the team. The reason being is once you have an experience that you feel is comfortable for all, you want to run it past that one person to make sure that you're going to capture as wide an audience as possible. And yeah, we, we've seen that as well. Uh, the other big points on, on my side were um, projects standing up, moving around, having testers having to stand up for eight hours. Uh, it, it can take its toll on, on some people. Um, and I would say the biggest point about this on, on my side, and it has been uh, some, sometimes difficult with some project, is actually wondering if the sickness is actually caused by a bug or not. And you don't know. And you actually have to engage that discussion with the dev and see, hey, are, is, it, is there an issue here? Is there something to fix here? Do we need to look into this or not? Uh, and this is weird because obviously this is not something we're used to be doing in terms of testing. We're touching a bit more user experience than actually functionality. What type of questions should you ask your employees before they join the VR team? Do you want to ask them if they know how to swim or if they'd like to swim? Do they'd like to fly? Would you like to travel through space or time? Last answer is are you a masochist? Okay, so the winner for this question is number three. 
Number three, we have a variety of winners here. Um, in VR, we have a term we like to call presence. It's the ability of once you put that headset on to be transported to another place in time where you believe you're actually there. Uh, we do a demo in, in our typical suite. I think it's at retail now, and, and uh, when you first get an Oculus, it's available to you, where we put you on the top of a really tall skyscraper. And this is when we've done before. And for a lot of people, they feel like they're standing on the edge of a skyscraper. We ask them to step forward, and as much as they want to, as much as they know it's not going to hurt them, for whatever reason, the lizard brain part of the brain refuses to let them go forward because they think they're going to fall. I've had a person that was afraid of heights do this demo. As soon as we put him up there, he ripped the headset off. So the challenge is with your test teams as you're going to build them and they're doing these VR experiences is it's very easy to freak people out. Um, horror games are extremely popular right now because it's really easy to do jump scares. Um, it's very easy to put people in different situations they might not come comfortable with. So what you have to do is make sure that your team's willing to embrace that and willing to try things. Um, so you really need a team invested and willing to try different things and be in different places. On, uh, on our side, there's, there's that, obviously, and we had the same experience. Sometimes there are going to be some, some games that, you know, for you it's going to be, oh, you're flying, this is awesome, and it's not going to be awesome for some of, their, of our users. We had people that, you know, with claustrophobia, fear of water, and, and they stop right away, you know, and, and, and that you need to take into account. The other big point is, you know, we, we got potential of fear of, of long-term impacts, and, and we don't know. Like, to put you in context, I have a tester, like a long-standing tester that came to me and said, Matt, I'm dreaming in VR. I don't fully understand what he meant by that, but essentially, I just told him, hey, you know, you've been testing for a week nonstop, so you just dream what you see during the day, and told me, no, this never happened with any other game before. It seems like the, the full immersion of senses really impacts the brain and how you think, and, and you're really into it, and it, it, it does have a lot more effect. And that actually brought another discussion I had with my managers, which is, okay, when do we expect the first time we're actually going to get sued because we will have caused trauma to someone? And, and that's weird. That's very weird. And we'll still, we'll still need to test those games. We'll still need to find those people. But, you know, I imagine like a crazy real-life war game, and you might have some people that are going to get as traumatized as, as a soldier or close to it. So it's something that we really need to look into and, and keep close tabs on. Question five. You're setting up a VR lab for your company. How much space do you need per employee? So more than normal amount, so like 1.5 meters wide, more than usual, three meters, a lot of space, four meters, or a whole room, five plus meters. Uh, so far, uh, number four is the winner. That's going to be very costly if you do that and you're a company. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. It can happen. Some of the games will have those features. Um, and by the way, that's an animation of two of my testers. Uh, so yeah, so you do need some extra space. Those guys will not necessarily see and probably not see or understand what is around them. Um, you need to plan for a little bit more, but obviously if you're a company, you need to calculate that properly uh, if it doesn't cost into your space and then cost as well. And we have a rule at Oculus, and it's basically, uh, it's never the person in VR's fault. That refers to people's faces, it refers to the controllers in their hands, it refers to them walking into walls. Um, you just can't see in that space, so you have to be careful what's going on. One of the benefits that we have in working with uh, you know, Babel and Keywords is actually setting up multiplayer spaces. Space is valuable. It's valuable at, at our office, it's valuable everywhere. If we're not setting up at developer stations, if I'm, for example, I'm actually running a four versus four multiplayer test uh, back home, I can't get that number of stations that much space available to do dedicated spacing. Um, so it is one of the benefits and one of the things you need to be able to provide if you are gonna do VR testing uh, as an external company. So yeah, you guys got about three points now. Uh, you have a PlayStation VR project coming in and ordered 20 headsets from Sony. How many headsets do you actually receive? None? Six? 12? Or 20? Lock in your vote now. Okay, uh, number two. 
That's good. Absolutely. That's me trying to get a PlayStation VR. No. Uh, um, so, so yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, um, obviously, uh, it's, it's new tech uh, for everyone. Um, for the Oculus project, we're lucky enough that we work directly with, with them, so we get what we need. Uh, some other projects uh, on Sony or other type of VR or AR, uh, well, you guys know. You guys went through the same situation. Anytime there's new hardware coming in, uh, sometimes it's a bit of a hassle to actually get it until it's actually officially published uh, outside. Uh, it impacts uh, logistic and development. You need to understand who are your contacts are at, at those uh, distributor. You need to have really good relation. You need to understand the process of procurement better than they do. Uh, sometimes we even add to hold the hands of some people to, no, 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 this is how it works. Just send us the machine, contact that guy, blah, blah. Uh, everything is good now, but obviously sometimes it's difficult. Uh, so you have five points now. Question, a bug is being thrown back and forth between a tester and a dev, switching between statuses of not a bug and will you just open your eyes, please? What do you do? Ask a tester to close the issue, ask a dev to fix the issue, book an hour long meeting, or chug a ginger ale and call it a day. Okay, number two again. Number two. Close. So, you have to book some meetings. And, and the issue here is essentially the discrepancy of, of what is seen uh, between 2D and 3D, but also between internal and external hardware and versions. It, it gets pretty crazy. There's no way to actually show or depict to a, an outside user that doesn't have an headset um, what the issue is without actually getting them a headset on. Um, that's the first thing. And, and second thing, on we've seen a lot of, of discrepancies, again, with the amount of mobile devices or a new version of hardware coming in, depending on the situation, the mix of, you know, is it because of your graphics card? Is it because of X, Y, Z? And it happens a lot. I would add that um, a solution when you're in that hour-long meeting is to rely on your best practices. You all have development experience, and this is just a new platform and a medium just like every other one we've seen before. So take your development practices, things that you know how to do with everything you've done prior, and apply that to VR. The answers are gonna be different, but you're probably gonna ask the same questions. Uh, and that is the best way to kind of help us create the best practices for this device. Good. It's the middle of July. Um, your air conditioning has gone out and you're testing away in the heat, at least you're trying to. How often do you need to clean your VR headset? Do you need every 10 minutes, every hour, at the end of your shift, or do you just let the next guy take care of it? Okay, number one is the answer. Good choice. Um, the headsets can get sweaty. Uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot more active experiences where people are immersed in these, in these environments, in these spaces, and they get super involved. Um, the best way to maintain the, the hygiene of the device is to keep it clean as often as you can. Um, there are also a couple third-party companies that have created um, you know, non-water permeable covers that you can put on the heads of devices. So you can just wipe them with a cloth. But the best way to keep them clean is to maintain them. Um, oftentimes, you can, most of those headset or those facial interfaces also come off. So if you have some extra, swap them in and out. Uh, and just make sure that they're as dry and as clean as possible. Um, yeah, that's what, what we do. I would say the other thing in, in terms of challenge is, uh, well, Montreal, not July, but during winter, uh, there's the obvious flu season. Uh, that's not fine. So you really need to take care of, of not only the headsets, but whatever gear you add to it and clean it extremely often, else you're just going to get your whole team sick, and that's going to cost you a whole lot more than you know a few wipes or a few cleaning. Um, the second tip I can give you is if someone's sick, don't let him test. Not only for actually him getting other people sick, but he's going to get woozy a lot faster, uh, and you're going to see it. 
to that, I can also add, don't let a tester test or a friend or yourself if you're a little bit hungover. <laughs> if you have 10 testers and you're doing a mobile VR project across four different types of phones, I call it, uh, how many phones do you need? Do you need 10 phones, one for each tester? Do you need 40? Do you need 80? Or do you need a whole lot and we'll just go with 200? Okay, we're gonna go with number two, 40. 40. We're giving the most points to 200. A little bit jokingly, but actually this is pretty true. Um, mobile devices with VR require a lot of perf. Perf does two things on your mobile device. It's gonna drain heat, it's gonna drain your battery. When these devices get hot, you're gonna lose perf. So you're kind of in this weird balance of always needing a fresh, cool device that's always charged. One of the problems with rapid charging that we see with a lot of these modern phones is it also makes the phone hot. So you've got to have enough phones to be able to get you through this. Some advice I would give is always start with your highest performance phones um, so they can handle the, the, the necessary demands of VR on the mobile pretty easily. The other thing that we've seen teams do is have them test and develop in a PC headset that doesn't have the same issues with heat and perf and then only switch to phones once you're going to work on perf only on that device. Yeah, on, on our side for pre-alpha and alpha version of some of the games, uh, again, depending on the phones that, that were used, we saw some phones overeat in less than 15 minutes. Uh, that's quite a surprise. Uh, that's quite harsh on resources and how you actually plan your work with your testing. You know, you have like literally a tester with a box of phone trying to do his day of work. And, and when the phone is overheat, overheated, you know, there's nothing you can do about it except wait. If you're trying to cool it faster, you're going to break it, uh, and you're going to have a whole lot more problems uh, than that. You know, same goes with battery. It goes hand in hand, unfortunately. So before any work happens, how much does it cost to set up VR testing for a team of 80 people? 50K, 100K, 200K, or just ask Facebook to pay for it. Okay, we're gonna go with number three. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, absolutely. It is expensive. Um, to be fair, uh, it's a lot, more, a lot less expensive now than what it used to be a year ago. Uh, I think the market really got used to all of the up upcoming technology and you know, it's, it's the usual thing, right? You buy something now which is the top of the line, in a year it's gonna cost about half of what you just paid. Uh, so at that time, the minimum you would spend is about $1,000 US. I would say an average probably around 2000 2500 if you really wanted to do the full spec of work because obviously there's not just funk in there, there's compat. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it can get quite expensive. These were high-end machines a year ago. They're less high-end machines now. Um, you know, the, the advent of the new video cards that are coming out with the 10 series with NVIDIA uh, has been hugely beneficial to us. We're also seeing laptops that are now capable of VR. Um, so the cost of entry is much lower. Uh, one point we talked about actually yesterday was that uh, a lot of people think that gear is more accessible or that mobile is more accessible because it's a mobile device and not a PC device. But Matthew brought up an excellent point is that these phones are actually unlocked out of the box are almost as expensive as the PCs you need. Yep. Uh, to run in VR as well. So it's just something to think about as you're determining you know, mobile versus PC. Because you got the new phones coming out, and for those that buy them for work, you know, it's $1,000, $1,200 per phone. It goes up as well. Question 11. You just started working on a new VR title with new VR hardware with your new team. How many checklists, test case do you need to go through to make sure everything's Good and okay. One set of test case, five, ten, or what's a test case? Okay, the audience favorite is number three. Nope. Yeah. Your guy's going back down. You got eight points now. <laughs> so the answer, surprisingly, is, is what's a test case? <laughs> uh, when this started, everything was new. There was no standardized testing method. Uh, there was no official certification regulation, no baseline comparison, everything was new. Um, the guidelines, the tools, uh, everything had to be built from scratch. 
Uh, we were even in a situation at the beginning where uh, we were working with, with Oculus and they asked us, hey, you know, if we would do like an Oculus program, an Oculus ready program, like what do you recommend we, we could check? Well, we could do this. Okay, this is the official cert line now. Um, so it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, discovery, a lot of new work. And just echoing on what I said earlier, this is new. There are best practices that we're still discovering. Rely on your past experiences, but these are different test cases. Um, you've never had to write a test case where the left eye and the right eye are swapped. You never had to write a test case that tells a user to actually spin in place, look up and look down. Um, so you just have to rely on kind of all the past systems and processes you put in place and apply them to this new device. You're starting work one day and you realize that on the same game, half of your team is seeing some really weird and neurotic stuff and the other team isn't. What do you do? Ask the developers what they broke? Do you ask the testers what they broke? Reinstall all firmware and software just to be safe? Or it's easy, you know, you get Unreal, Unity, Nvidia, AMD, Samsung, Oculus, HTC, Sony, all on a call and hash it out. Best answer is? Number three. Number three. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> number three is a point. Best answer here is actually number four. We've had to do this several times. It's because this is so new. Um, hardware, drivers, uh, new versions of devices, everything coming out all at once. You have to really call around and ask everybody, what did you change? Did you change anything? Are you sure? Um, a good example of this is actually on the mobile side. A lot of people familiar with mobile know that you have to plan for different devices, different configurations. But because these devices are so new and VR is so new, oftentimes the phone device is coming out with new firmware weekly, monthly, in order to make things better. Most territories, the carriers will not release those updates until they do a carrier update. So you have to plan for each territory, each carrier, and the different types of phones that are going on in each market to try and figure out what's going on. So it can be rather complicated to track down what the real issues are. As of yet on our side, and, and the answer number four is actually what we had to do. Uh, we literally got on the phone with the majority of the firmware players, of graphics card, of engine guys, uh, up to the point that now, uh, sometimes before Unreal, Unity, and NVIDIA do update, they actually give us a call, um, <laughs> send us a patch, and say, hey, you know, so not to redo the breakage of everything worldwide, can you guys test it out on a few machines and see what it does? Um, it's, uh, it's weird, it's fun, it's, it's new, again, that, that's the main thing. Final question, what's the best way to spread VR best practices? Is it through training? Is it through preaching, delegating, or working with others? Or talking at an XDS? Number four, talking at XDS. Did you rig that vote? <laughs> um, the only wrong answer here is actually preaching. Um, there are a lot of people talking about VR. A lot of them have never actually even tried VR. Uh, just because it is a popular topic, there's a lot of money being poured into it. Um, the best way to build VR practices is to come to th these types of events. It's to work with uh, each other. Uh, VR is actually a pretty small community. Uh, we're all invested in making sure it succeeds. So we're all pretty sharing and willing to, to provide details and best practices for what we've come up with. I, I would say that one of the reasons why we're actually partnering with external uh, services to do a lot of our publishing services is because we want that expertise to get out in the field. We don't want to keep it internal and just keep it for ourselves. We want to work with teams like Babel and have them develop best practices internally that they can then share with the community at large. Yeah, on, on our side, this, this partnership was, was great. Uh, going back to one of the things I was telling you about earlier on uh, the three months to actually build out a team, I, I'm, I'm sure this wouldn't have worked or wouldn't have been as easy as to do VR and build a VR team internally if we, if we wouldn't have had that support from, from Oculus and that understanding. Because we had other clients that, yeah, that wouldn't have rolled, like waiting for a month, two months, three months to actually be fully good and ready and productive and go full speed. So yeah, we are very lucky of that, for sure. So you guys got uh, 11 points. <laughs> So let's look at what 11 points give you. <laughs> 10 to 17 points. You're going to be okay. 
you'll just be like that guy in a group that nods and laughs and has no idea of what's happening. <laughs> it's good enough. So congrats. You are technically ready for the future. Thank you. Um, before leaving the stage, I wanted to give a big thing, thanks to uh, Chris uh, and, and his team, Madeline, and, every, and everyone uh, behind it. Uh, Grayson, I don't know if he's still here, uh, who was actually our coach for the presentation. Really, really helpful. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll see you out Thank there. You.